Mmm, check this out. A wonderful calzone. Oh, beautiful, packed full of cheese. And I got some pepperoni and basil up in there. Oh, I tell you what, this is a delight. Wait till you try it. This is yummy. Hello, welcome back to Texas Cooking Today. On this episode, we're going to be making an Italian man that has become an American favorite. It's called a calzone. It's sort of like a cheese pizza that's folded in on itself. So I'll tell you what, I got a lot of goodies right here. Come a little closer and let's go over what we're going to do to make these wonderful little delights. Well, I tell you what, we have all kinds of wonderful goodies here. So let's go over what all we're going to use to make our simple calzones. Back here, first of all, this is our flour, and we're going to start with our dough. I have two and a half cups of flour here, and with that I'll be combining three quarters of a cup of hot water. You want hot tap water, and that'll work fine. And I have some sugar, salt, and uh, some yeast right here. Now, that's two teaspoons, two teaspoons, and two teaspoons, very simple. Or one package, which is equal to two and a quarter teaspoons. Either way, it'll work fine. Very simple. Let's move over to our fillings. Here we have some cheeses. I have some ricotta cheese back here. We have some mozzarella cheese over here. Nice creamy mozzarella. And this is Parmesan, the real thing. And uh, we've got it freshly grated up. And we're gonna use that in there for massive amounts of flavor. Down here I have some basil and some, uh, this is uh, pepperoni. It's commonly used on pizzas. It tastes great inside of calzones. And you don't have to use pepperoni. You don't have to use any meats at all. Or you can use other meats, you know, like Italian sausage, hamburger, prosciutto ham, whatever you can think of to put in there. Just make sure it's not too juicy. And then here we're going to make a separate sauce. And the sauce is not going to be going down into the calzone itself. The sauce is going to be separate for dipping. And for this, I'm going to be using just some simple tomato paste here. This is eight ounces of tomato paste, three tablespoons or a quarter of a cup of basil. And this dried basil will work fine for this. This is one tablespoon of rubbed thyme. You want the real fine powder there. Right here, I've got some garlic. We're going to use a couple cloves of that in it. And we have some white Zinfandel. And whatever wine you want to use will work fine, but I like to use wine to thin down these mar red marineras because A, it gives them this fruity boost, it adds a little more acid to it, makes it a little sharper, and, and if you, as long as you keep it simple on the herbs and spice, then it really brings out something super special in a red sauce. So use the KISS method on your red sauce. That's keep it simple, stupid. Simple ingredients, simple methods make for really good marineras, all right? So there we have it, just some very simple ingredients. If you don't have basil, if you want to use spinach instead, that would work. Uh, I use spinach a lot in these things and they're really good that way. But this time I just wanted to kind of be weird and go with some basil because I love fresh basil inside of things like this. Back here, there's some olive oil. The olive oil is going to be used in the crust as well as on top of the crust at the end of making the calzone just before baking it and that, that allows it to uh, bake into the crust and it kind of fries the exterior of the crust in a way and gives it a unique flavor and just a wonderful texture. These are going to be great so let's move right on to making our dough first. Let's head on back to our mixer. Okay, we are here at our mixer. I went ahead and switched jackets. I like to work in a white jacket when I'm messing with flour. So what I want to do first, let's take the flour and place it right there in my mixing bowl. On top of that, I'm going to place my sugar, my salt, those. I'm going to give a quick stir, mix them into the flour. Let's put in that yeast. Now, you don't have to pre weight that yeast in order to do a good bread, okay? The minute it becomes moist from the water hitting this flour, it's going to start activating right at that point. So you don't have to pre activate yeast. Now, let's pour three quarters of a cup of hot water in there, and that's just hot tap water. I didn't have to heat it up at all. And one last goodie. We need some olive oil in this. And I want to put in quite a bit. That's about one tablespoon, two tablespoons, 
and right there, about three tablespoons. That's a quarter of a cup. And that's going to make a nice texture to the dough. All I have to do is just let that run until it's well mixed. Otherwise, if you're going to do it by hand, to just get your hands in there, knead it up, and the minute it turns into a good solid ball, start kneading it for about, oh, five minutes, then just set it aside. There's you a little better view if you want to watch that happen. Now there are various ways that you can rise bricks, but it is wise whenever you're working with yeast to rise your dough product in a glass bowl. That is because yeast does not react well with metal. Metal will actually kill yeast. So it's good to use glass, that way any contact surface areas get good rising as well as the rest of the uh, dough. Now, when I'm doing this, I also like to invert another bowl. And this makes a nice dome cover. It allows for uh, humidity to build inside of this without really being lost. You can also use, uh, some people like to just use a cup, uh, cup towel over this or some sort of a pastry cloth, and that is fine. So either way, but you might be smart to rise in a glass bowl. And I like to do it either on top of a warm refrigerator or over the pilot of a stove. What I'm doing is getting all my goodies ready. I have a pan here, I'll place on the pilot, and then my rising bowl on top of that. Very simple. Sometimes, sometimes you'll get a dough that will stick on the bottom of the bowl a little bit and that can mean a couple of things. It can mean your moisture content is a little bit high or it can mean it just hasn't kneaded long enough and I think that's the case here. I'm just going to turn it in on itself and we'll throw it right back down in that bowl and let the machine do just a little bit more.
forget, anytime you're cooking, it never hurts to have a beverage handy, something to wet the whistle, and just to make you comfortable. You fix whatever you like. Sometimes I just love green tea. This is a bad day. Okay, I believe it is time to get all this brought together. It has needed long enough. It's still just nice and warm. It has a very elastic feel to it, good and stretchy, but that's going to develop more. And I didn't mention the flour that I used in this. I like using a high gluten flour. I know that these days that sort of sounds funny, but frankly, gluten is not a bad thing. Gluten is simply protein, okay? And it's the protein structure that acts like a glue that makes the bread to rise and, and become very uh, unique and flexible in its qualities. Uh, the truth of the matter is gluten isn't a bad thing the way a lot of people are painting it these days. It is simply a protein. It's not a bad thing. Unless protein has suddenly become bad. Alright, I have my bowl here that we were talking about earlier. Let's just place that ball of dough right in it. I'm going to put the dome cover on top. And I have some pieces of tape that I'm just going to use to hold that in place. Right now it's on top of a uh, pilot on a burner, so that's going to provide it a good warm surface. And I have above it here a halogen light that's providing some extra heat from above, so it's going to heat this dome just a little bit. Now, let's move on to the sauce. Yummy sauce. So as you can see now, there's not much work in making that dough. It's a very simple process and it doesn't take a lot of work by hand either. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is work on making our sauce. But the first thing I need to do, and I've already started on this while the dough was mixing, I was putting some plastic wrap over my cheeses and getting them covered and ready to go back in the fridge. I want to keep everything good and fresh. So I'm going to put the basil, cheeses, and all this right back in my refrigerator. We're going to keep those fresh until the dough is finished rising. Remember, that rise on the dough will take you a couple of hours. About an hour per rise. We're going to rise it twice. Now, let's start on our sauce. Now, I wanted to show you how I'm going to be mincing up this garlic. And there's a lot of different ways that you can handle garlic. If you have a garlic press, that works really good. Some people like to just crush it and lightly chop it. That's fine. But I'm going to show you how to do a fine mince and to do it with a knife. First of all, let's talk about the knife. The knife itself to do a mince with, you're going to need something that has an offset from the handle. And what I mean is the edge right here needs to set down a considerable distance from the handle right here. And the idea there is so that the handle can allow it to rock up and down. And if it is uh, uh, an edge that's close to that handle, like right up here, that is not achievable. So you need this kind of an offset to work. A sand works good for this. Any blade that's between about, oh, uh, seven and nine inches works really good for this also. Now, I have three cloves of garlic here. Yes, I know, you see four, but there are three. Let me explain. This is your average size clove of garlic. This one's a little bit oh, smaller. It's about a medium, and these are some small ones. What I'm looking for is about a tablespoon of fine minced garlic, and this is what's going to give it for me. But if you don't have, you know, a breakdown like this, you want three large ones like that. So I have three cloves of garlic there. Make sense now? Or just more confusing? Okay, let's move that off. Now, to mince garlic. The first thing you need to do is to get these so they're not bouncing around while you're trying to cut them, okay? And the best way to do that is just simply to crush them. Now I'm going to hit my blade with my hand, but when I do this, I don't want this edge pointed up or anything. I want it kind of angling down like so, which means the back side is going to be a little high, and sometimes when you do this, the garlic will spit out. Don't be surprised if that happens, and don't let it discourage you. It just happens, okay? Get over it. So turn that edge down. Hit it good and firm with your hand, and that will match it just like so. Isn't that neat? Now, a 
little bit shot out. Again, we do not lose any sleep over that little bit that shoots out. If I had to count the number of times garlic shot out from under my knife, I don't think I could. Now the motion I'm making here is very, very simple. But the way you need to do it is something that you have to be careful about. And what I'm doing here is I'm keeping my thumb tucked under. And I'm using these fingers on top of the blade at the end of it to provide a down pressure. So all I have to do is move the handle up and down and I get the right action. So I move it to the garlic. That's all that motion is, very simple. When you're pushing garlic off of the blade, do not run your finger lengthwise or you will cut your hand. Push it off the edge of the blade like so, away with your finger moving away from the edge, not along it. Now, as you get it broken down a little more, it's a little easier to speed up your hand. So all you have to do is just speed up the how fast you're moving your hand up and down. And you can make this real quick and easy. I'm going to do that once more because I want a little finer grind on it. Uh huh? Now, we have our garlic all minced up, and that's about a tablespoon, it's just about perfect, just what I was looking for. Now let's get on to making that marinara. Now, to prepare the marinara, let's take our garlic first, place it right down in the pan, and I want to put some olive oil in there also, and what I want is about two tablespoons of olive oil, or slightly more, that's fine, and I have about two tablespoons right there. I'm going to turn that burner on, and I want my burner set to a low heat, and I'm going to gently bring up the temperature on this, and allow that olive oil to just break apart the garlic, and to gently fry it, and I want to only turn that about the color of a peanut. You see how light and white looking it is now, kind of a yellowish white? Well, we want to turn it into, like I said, the color of a peanut, which is just the right amount of uh, toasting on garlic without getting it bitter tasting. Pardon me as I take care of my knife. Always keep them nice and clean. As the temperature comes up on this, the oil's viscosity will become thin and it'll allow you to whisk around that garlic and break it apart. Just a hair more, not much. And yes, that olive oil also adds to the flavor of the marinara. It's all a combinative deal. And look how fine that uh, the mince is on that. Isn't that wonderful? Just with a simple knife, and it didn't take but what, a couple of minutes. There we go. Now, like I mentioned earlier, you're going to want some uh, wine out. And of course, make sure that you have your tomato paste available. Now the reason why I like to use a tomato paste like this rather than working off of fresh tomatoes, if I can get a tomato fresh, and I mean truly fresh, like uh, uh, farm fresh and ripened that day it was picked, uh, that's a perfect thing to have. And sometimes community gardens have real good varieties like that. For right now it's not in season. So it's best to go with a canned tomato, and I know that sounds horrible. However, think about this. When tomatoes are picked in the field, in the commercial uh, tomato business, the ones that are ripe do not go to market. They go immediate to 
candy. And that's the reason they're so sweet, is they were the ones that were truly vine ripened. They have that perfect flavor. That's the reason canned tomatoes taste so much sweeter than just a plain tomato in the uh, uh, produce department of your grocery store. Ah, did you know that? Huh? Pretty neat, huh? So, anyway, if you want better quality and truly vine ripened tomatoes, uh, unless you can get them at just the right point in the season and local, you're better off to go with a canned. You'll get a, a sweeter flavor, a more tomatoey flavor. Remember, I have that heat on low. We're just very gently frying this, and the smell of it is just beautiful. The garlicky odors coming up through the air. And here I have two things happening. A, I have a garlic release into the oil, flavoring the oil, which then disperses that flavor better through the marinara. But also, I have a toasting effect going on, which gives me the toasted garlic flavor that is absolutely divine. Take a look at that color. Just a little bit more time. What we're looking for are for the smaller pieces to turn that that light peanut color, that slight tan color. And they are not far away from it. They're starting to turn now. Mm -hmm. See the color on those and the change that they've had? Now, I have the right color change. I'm gonna drop the heat until I can get this in and partially hydrate it. Now, I want a whisk. Pour in some of that wine. And start working all of that together into that paste. And we're also gonna add some water to this, but most of the thinning will be done with wine. Look at that. Beautiful, isn't it? And I'm using a white Zinfandel. Like I said, you can use any wine you'd like. I recommend either a white wine or something like a white Zinfandel that's light and fruity and acidic. I don't want it to be too dry. In this case, you need your marinara to really sparkle. Now, my basil. Remember that was a quarter of a cup of basil or three tablespoons and a tablespoon of thyme. A bit more wine. All in all I put in about a cup of wine total, maybe a little bit more. And uh, from there, any more fluid that I need in this to hydrate it or to thin it out, I will simply use water. But at this point, I have a nice smooth sauce, and it looks like we're going to end up making a very good marinara this way. Look how simple and thin that is. Easy. I didn't take anything, and all I have to do is to finish cooking this off for about 30 minutes. It'll need to simmer that way. Okay? Now, it's a matter of giving that time as it simmers. Remember to stir this frequently. You don't want it to burn on the bottom. So simmer it on low. And uh, as that happens, you want to stir it about every five to eight minutes. I'm dropping my flame to low. And I'll bring the temperature up slowly and easily on this. The minute it starts bubbling, you might want to put a cover on it because it will splatter all over your stove otherwise. Now, it has been about, oh, 40 minutes on the rise time so far. So what I wanna do is simply take this top cover off, and you notice there's this moisture buildup inside, nice condensation, that's very normal. And I wanna take this, which is also almost doubled in bulk, and I'm just gonna flip him over. And that reason I get heat on both sides of the dough really well, and it does rise just a little bit better. Remember, that's a fairly stiff dough, so it's kind of difficult for it to rise up and become soft. 
I've had my sauce simmering now for about, oh, 20 minutes, and I've just now removed it from the heat for one reason. Sometimes when you go to stirring these things, if it's still on the heat, it's going to bubble and spatter all over the place. If you'll remove it, that'll slow that bubbling down, and that doesn't happen. Now, let's take a look at this. It has gotten considerably thicker, okay, and I don't want it quite that thick. All right, so what I'm going to do for the last few minutes of the simmer, is I'm going to add some hot water to this. There we go. That's about half a cup. And then right back to where the consistency was. Uh, close to where it was when we started this. And that's good. Just another tablespoon or two. There you are. Now, it's going to let that continue to simmer. Finish its last 10 minutes of simmering. At that point, we're also going to take a look at our dough, which has been rising up nicely. Okay, we are now back onto this dough, and it has had plenty of time to rise up. About an hour and five minutes, in fact. I've just turned off the heat on my sauce. I'm going to move it out of my way. Now, my dough has... Uh, risen up it's looking beautiful right now and I'm just going to take this very gently lift it and I want to roll the top part inward the hot part which is laying down I have on top here and I'm rolling it out very gently I'm just going to squeeze it on the bottom and that's all I'm going to do I'm going to put it right back in there we're going to raise uh, rise that up another and when it's finished for another hour, then I'm ready to make calzones. Now, one thing about this kind of a dough, if you want to make this stuff a day in advance, rise it once, put it in the refrigerator or the freezer, and then bring it back out to bring it up to temperature just before you want to cook, that works also. Uh, it's a very versatile dough, so please feel free to give this thing a try. I think you're really going to like it. Okay, uh, it's time for us to pull our dough out. It has been a full two hours of rising, and it looks beautiful. Now you can see where I turned it over earlier, and this is one of the folds from where I had been rolling it under. That's just perfectly fine. Now, what I want to do with this is divide it into four parts. So, I'm just going to simply cut it down the center. And one thing that you can do, if you're not sure if your, your lines are going to come out perfect, is you can kind of pre-mark it a little bit, see if you're, you're kind of on track or not. There we go. Just slide through that. I'll split each one of these. There we are. Now, I have three nice little triangles of dough. There's just one problem. Calzones aren't made from a triangle of dough. They're made from a round piece of dough. So what I need to do is to simply take these and work them. So this will be a nice, nice little circle. Now, as we work this out, and here's the thing, you don't have to make a perfect circle with this. It's not a requirement, okay? What we're trying to do is to make something close to a circle so that we can form a crescent when we fold it over.
that nice. See how I did that? Just kept working that roller from side to side, working it around. There I have a nice little crescent that I can use. I want that to be just slightly larger, but not much. My dough right now, in the thicker parts, is about an eighth of an inch thick. And in the thinner parts, closer to a sixteenth. So I'm gonna spread that thicker part out a little bit. Just like that. Once you get these rolled out like that, it's not a problem. Add just a little bit of extra flour on it, so you have a nice dry surface. You can push that aside and just keep working them one at a time. There we go. There we go. We're just going to keep working these out one at a time. If you notice, it doesn't take me a lot of flour to do this because I have made a dough that was really, really dry. If it wasn't, it would be sticking to this roller really bad. Now, if you notice occasionally, like right then, it does stick to the roller. That's what causes it to pull up. I need a little more flour. Do this on both sides, just lightly. Right back to that same rolling. as I've mentioned before, one by one. Oops, there we go. As I mentioned, sometimes it'll grab a little bit. That's when you know it's time for flour. too neat about this. Go ahead and just have at it. You can be a bit unruly about it. You notice I'm not going to overwork it and you shouldn't either. Kind of triangular shape. Now watch what I do. I take the dough and stretch it and reshape it a little bit to form whatever I want it to do, okay? So don't be afraid to work that dough in any way you want. If you don't have a roller, you can still work it out, okay? Remember, those that make pizzas in Italy, they don't do rollers. It's called hand tossing. There we go. Let's sit there for just a moment. It'll slowly contract. As it does, that's fine. It's 
thing of this is, I want it to stay out there as long as I can. Pulling those sides a little bit. There we go. There we go. Another half round. There we go. And all I'm doing with those little triangles is just sort of working them into a ball first and then pushing it out. And there we have it. Simple little round. Now we're making four good sized calzones here. A single calzone of this size is more than enough meal for a single uh, adult. And uh, it's quite a bit of food all, on the whole. Now, give that a moment, as I mentioned, like I did on the last one. It just gives it a chance to uh, remain stretched for a bit. There we go. Now, what we're going to do is go ahead and make one of our calzones. I'm going to start with this one right here. First thing I want to do though is remove from the flour from my location just to clean it up a little bit. Now I'm going to break out my ingredients as soon as we have those out. We move right on to making calzones. It is now time for us to line out our calzone with our ingredients. And one thing I want to mention before we do this is you want to make sure that you leave a border inside of the calzone of about a uh, one inch away from the uh, edge. So we're going to keep all of our ingredients in the center part here, leaving ourselves a one inch border all the way around, making it a lot easier to seal it up in the end. Now, what we're going to start with is some ricotta cheese. And I'm going to place this right on the top up here. And I'm going to mash it down, just kind of press it into place. You don't have to be real neat about this. But like I said, you just want to leave that little border around the edge. And feel free to use plenty of ricotta. This is that smooth, creamy cheese that's really going to make the calzone worth eating, okay? This is that wonderful, wonderful smooth, creamy flavor that you get in it. And uh, of course it, it works with the other cheeses as well, but the ricotta is just absolutely indispensable for this. Now I'm using a fairly firm ricotta. Uh, different brands, you know, some are, are a little bit more liquidy than others. And I like this one because it's real dry. And this is important in making calzones. You want good dryish ingredients. Uh, for instance, like this mozzarella. You do not want to use mozzarella that is from a ball. If you have to slice it up, if it's not gratable, then uh, it's got way too much moisture in it and it's going to give you problems when you go cooking up your calzone, okay? So you're looking for some 
cheeses, especially your uh, mozzarella and your ricotta, that do not have excessive moisture in them, okay? If you'll notice, I'm really stacking on some cheese on this. Remember, that's what the calzone is about. It's, it's all about cheese and, and a few other little goodies in it that just make it really wonderful. But, man, if it isn't for the cheese, you don't have a calzone. I'm telling you now. All right. Let's move right on to our next ingredients. Now we have, of course, our Parmesan and that beautiful sausage that we were talking about earlier, our pepperoni. You can use all kinds of meats. And then that basil, beautiful basil. First thing I want to do is go in with some meat right on top of this lower cheese here. And it doesn't take a lot. Remember, this is uh, something where you don't just have to pile ingredients up into it. There we go. Beautiful. Now I'm going to put some of this cheese right up on top of the pepperoni. This is that Parmesan that we grated fresh. Well, I call Parmesan fresh. Imagine that. It's been aged. Okay. Nonetheless, it's still the, uh, the block form of Parmesan. And now, of course, uh, time for our basil. And when you're putting this basil on, every once in a while you'll come across basil leaves that'll have some little little spotting on it or something like that. Don't let that bother you at all. Just go ahead and put those basil leaves on there. That spotting will not affect the flavor or the quality of what's going on. Take those small leaves free from the stem. There we go. I think I want to get these larger leaves right on this edge and put the smaller ones toward the back. I think I usually get better results that way. And some people like to take the leaves and press them down into the ricotta. It sort of works out either way, so don't sweat it too much. There we go. Put him right on the end. Now. It's time to go ahead and fold this little gem, but something that you need to know. Remember we were using that high gluten flour? Something that's nice about gluten, it is like glue. It's a protein. So when it becomes wet, it sticks just like a glue. So here I have a little water. I'm just going to paint some water right onto the dough around this. There we go. Make it nice and wet. And as I do that, what's going to happen is that gluten is activating. It is forming a nice sticky layer right there. And as I fold this over, it's going to stick really well for me. Now, here's our problem. When you're folding a calzone, if you've got a lot of ingredients, they want to push some of them out. So you kind of have to fight it a little bit to keep everything tucked up inside. And pull that top over and stick it right down to that wet surface. There we go. Now, before I finish tamping this down, I want to take my ingredients and I want to push down on them. And I'm right now I'm seeing air push out the side over here. It's, it's called burping this and what you're doing is you're pushing out excessive air so that it's going to hold a nice compact tight shape. Now I'm going to press down those edges and if you'll notice it's sticking out nice and far that's just what we're looking for because we're going to wet it again. A little more water on that edge after we folded it because we're going to fold it over again and finish sealing it up. Folding there. There we go. Isn't that simple? There we have it. 
one stuffed cow salad, and I want to sit here and do this four more or uh, three more times to make a total of four calzones from the recipe that I have started. Now, here's the thing: is if you aren't hungry for four calzones or you don't need four calzones, take the others and freeze them. That's exactly what I'm going to be doing with them. And once they're frozen, you can pull them out anytime you would like. Put them in an oven at 375 degrees and let them cook for about 50 minutes. And those calzones will cook up just fine. Although, when you are cooking one fresh like this, those cooking instructions don't work. When you're cooking it fresh, you want to cook it at 450 degrees and it's going to take you about 20 to 22 minutes on the average. Uh, if you're high altitude, maybe a little bit longer. Okay, so we got our calzone ready to go here. We're going to get it on a pan, get it oiled up. That's with some olive oil and sprinkle it with some salt and it's time to put it in the oven. Ooh, yummy. I can't wait. Well, it's time for us to go ahead and move this calzone over to the board that, or uh, excuse me, the pan that I'm going to be cooking it on. And uh, then I'm going to get started on my others over here. Now put that on the pan upside down and I like to turn them every couple of minutes just so that they will uh, not get too dry on the upper side. Uh, like this piece here is it's very dry up here and that's fine. He'll be fine in just a little bit. So what I have here, same situation, we're starting all over. Just do it exactly the same way. And here's the thing, if you want to vary out your calzones and make different kinds, that's fine. Hey, there's no rule about how to make calzones. You get to make it however you like. Alright, so here we go with our ricotta. If you want to use cottage cheese instead of ricotta, yay, yeah, you can do that. You know why? Because it's your kitchen. By the way, it will work as a substitute for ricotta. It's not a good substitute, but it works. You might want to drain off part of the liquid on it, though, that uh, the way keep the curd, which is a solid part of what we're working with here. As you've noticed, I make my calzones quite intentionally thick. It needs a lot of cheese on the calzone, otherwise it's just, it, it's no good. That shredded cheese, as you're putting it on there, it doesn't hurt to go ahead and press it down, get some of that air out of it. Makes a much more workable dish. Get that sausage on there. If you're vegetarian, leave the sausage off. If you're vegan, well, I guess you're just stuck having to cook a um, something else, aren't you? Maybe you can fix you some eggplant. Uh-oh, I'm going to have vegans mad at me, calling me up, saying hateful things. How dare you say such things about vegans? My mother's a vegan and she's a wonderful woman. I can hear it now. So, if you're vegan and you're offended by that, well, stop watching shows like this, okay? It's just torture for you anyway. If you're vegetarian and you watch stuff like this, hey, <laughs> enjoy. Because this is a wonderful dish. Just omit the meat. And you're up and cooking. Now there's some more of those little black spots you'll see on the basil. Every once in a while that happens. And that's not a problem. As your basil ages a little, little spot a bit. It does not affect the quality of the flavor. Beautiful. 
Now, before I go stretching that over, get everything kind of pushed up on there, and we pull that stem off. And we're going to start wetting that edge down, this lower edge. Just remember a little bit of water on your fingers and you just paint it on with those. There we go. You get that gluten all nice and sticky. Fold the top over. And once I fold it over, I kind of just push the dough in the direction I need it to go so that I can make contact. There we go. Remember, sometimes you have to push those ingredients back up in there. Get up in there. There we go. There. Now, again, we're going to start that burping process. Pushing out the excess of air. Sealing that edge. Once again, a little more water. And if you're wondering what high gluten flour is to how to find it at the store, simple bread flour. If you buy the bread flour, got a high gluten flour. That's the reason they call it a bread flour. It's because it produces better quality bread structure due to the fact that it has extra gluten. There we are. Now this is one of the ones I'm going to take and refrigerate. It's really sticky on that edge. I got a bit too much water right there, but that's okay. It's going to dry out a bit and settle down and seal up real good. So, let's get down to what we have to do to make this freezeable and also to make it bakeable after we pull out of the freezer. What we want to do is to go ahead and put some slits right in the top of this. There we go. It doesn't hurt to have a few extras. You just want to give it some good cuts so that when you're baking it later on it will vent. Okay. Now I can take this calzone, place it up in the freezer, and it is ready to be frozen and used at a later date. Okay. Very simple stuff. Now we have our calzone ready to go into the oven. What I want to do is just finish it up. And to do this, I need to give it a good liberal coating of oil. Now a couple of ways you can do that. You could just pour the oil over the top and use a basting brush. That would work fine. But then of course, you're also going to be turning it over, so you're going to be getting it on your hands anyway, right? I like to glove up for something like that. After all, I'm going to be getting glove, uh, oil all over my hands, right? So, rub that oil all over it, get a good oil bath. Uh huh. Flip him over. See how he's kind of puffed up again? It's that yeast working on it. It's a good thing. It's helping that dough to get a little more aerated and it's going to produce a very nice crust. There we go. Now that I have that completely coated in oil, it's been flipped over and it is ready to go into the oven. Except, drop a little bit of salt over the top of it. It's nice to have a salty crust on the outside of a calzone. And then what I want to do here is a series of slits. One, two, 
three, four up above, and three below. And these nice little slits are going to help this to aerate real well so that it doesn't have any problems puffing up. You want it to stay flat and keep it shaped. Now it's off into the oven at 350 degrees. It'll need to be in there for about 20 to 25 minutes. And here it goes. 450. We're going to give it about 20 to 25 minutes. I'll set my timer for 20. <laughs> All right, it is now time for us to take our calzone out. It has been about 24 minutes. Look at the beautiful golden brown color on that. Let's get a closer look. Now, when your calzone comes out of the oven, it's going to be mighty hot, and you're going to want to make sure that it remains good and crisp underneath. So I recommend sliding a cooling rack right up underneath it. Just let it cool down. That sucker is still steaming, and it just needs a little bit of time. I'm going to give this 10 to 15 minutes to cool down, and then it's going to be ready to cut and enjoy. Oh boy, I tell you, the smell of this is just beckoning. Beautiful, beautiful calzone. We're going to take that and cut into it. Yes. All right. Look at that. The beautiful layering in it. Nice and thick. Nice crust on top. This calzone is ready for somebody to enjoy. Well, it's just as simple as that, a calzone. A wonderful little pizza dough folded over with lots of cheese inside and a few other little surprises. Well, I'll tell you what, look at this little gem. It's beautiful, isn't it? Can't wait. creaminess of the cheese, the saltiness of the dough, crunch, mm -hmm. and the basil, oh, everything is just this explosion of flavor in your mouth. It's like a pizza ramped up on steroids. <laughs> okay, I tell you what, give this little thing a try and you're going to love what you get. And uh, I tell you what, thank you. Thank you very much for watching Texas Cooking today. Please subscribe and you have a good day. Thank you for watching Texas Cooking Today, the show where you can get great recipes and the best techniques are taught. Please subscribe to Texas Cooking Today, where you will always find something hot and ready to eat.